When studying ecology in addition to studying energy flow in an ecosystem, which we've already talked about, another factor is to look at symbi symbiotic relationships. These are relationships between biotic factors, between living organisms. There are three major categories of symbiotic relationships, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. You can see by this Venn diagram that there are some areas of overlap and we're going to try to avoid the examples that um, can be confusing and, and end up in that overlap. We're going to concentrate on each of the three different forms of symbiotic relationship. The first we're going to start with is mutualism. And many of you will recognize what's growing on this tree, I hope. In your mind, think of what it is. It's a lichen. And it's composed of different organisms in a mutual symbiotic relationship. The definition of mutualism is that they both benefit. In this case, the mutualistic relationship is between a fungi and an algae. And here's a cross section of a lichen. So this entire thing is a lichen. And we see the fungal hyphae, thread like structures embedded in here we have the individual algae. Now they both benefit but how do they both benefit? The, fungi, the fungal al hyphae are absorbing water and nutrients and the algae are performing photosynthesis. That way they get nutrients from both of these and depending on what's going on in the um, the climate change or just what's going on seasonally, uh, any changes in the environment, they're able to share their resources. Um, and so this is mutualistic. They both benefit. This popular example of mutual ex mutualistic relationship are the acacia trees found in predominantly tropical rainforests and ants. And this is a website that shows a, a variety of different photographs involving the ants and the acacia relationship. Here's what the acacia trees look like. Uh, most of these have been stripped of most of their leaves. In addition to rainforest, there, it can also be found in some of the grassland areas. There are famous pictures of giraffes eating them. Here we have a picture of the actual ants swarming. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Um, they're, they're swarming around these nectaries. The, the plant provides these little food sources. And in addition to the food sources, notice that if you look off to the right of the picture, you see that thorn and you see the opening in the thorn that is actually placed to house the ants. So the ants are certainly benefiting from the relationship. Here's another view of a nectary being, being provided with food. In addition to the nectary, which is predominantly carbohydrate, look at these little packets of material that are mainly protein, which again um, are supporting the ants. Here they are eating those things. All right, so the classic line, as they say here, is that the ants drive away all insects and other invertebrates from the acacia. They also deter vertebrate herbivores from chewing on the leaves and even cut away the epiphytic plants. I'll talk about ep epiphytes in a moment. Um, that's not exactly the case. What they do is help to remove invaders, but they don't remove them all. For example, here's a beetle that's still eating at the leaves. Um, they don't seem to uh, deter some of the beneficial insects, like a praying mantis, which is good. Certainly, organisms like birds continue to build nests in the acacia. And some uh, here we have an example of some types of wasp nest in the acacia. But these insects are not harming the acacia. They're just, they're just using the facilities, as it were, and our good old stink bug there. So what it, 
the way that it's a mutualistic relationship is that um, they're both benefiting. The acacia tree is benefiting by having some protection by the ants. The ants are benefiting by having food and housing provided in the acacia tree itself. All right, a second example of symbiotic relationship is parasitism. This is the one you're probably most familiar with. Uh, we've been talking about parasites since you were in elementary school. Certainly a mosquito. Um, in any parasite relationship, the uh, parasite itself benefits and the host is harmed. In some cases, uh, it could be even be killed. Mosquitoes get the blood meal from the host predominantly warm-blooded uh, animals, and they can harm their host by uh, a variety of things. You get mild itching uh, because of the chemicals that were released in to keep the blood from clotting, or they could actually inject uh, a blood-borne pathogen like West Nile virus or malaria. A tapeworm is another prime example of a parasite. Here's a tapeworm that's been removed from the gut of an organism. Uh, that organism could be a human being. They live in the digestive tract and they rob that organism of nutrients so that the nutrients aren't absorbed into the animal. One more example, and this one that may not be as uh, familiar to you. This green object here is a tomato hornworm and they like to eat tomato plants so if you were growing tomatoes this summer you may have seen one but all of those little white structures that you see are not part of the hornworm they are actually eggs that are developing into larvae they were laid by this wasp and they lay them in huge numbers as you can see there and they've attached to the hornworm and as those larvae begin to to grow and develop they will take their nutrient suck it through the the skin of the hornworm and actually you know kill the hornworm in the process third relationship is commensalism and in commensalism, one of the organism benefits and the other it neither benefits nor is harmed. Here's a very common example. We have a whale and that's the organism that it neither is benefited nor harmed by the barnacles. The barnacles are living on their surface. And I particularly like this paragraph because there's a lot of vocabulary here uh, that you need to become comfortable with. So barnacles are crustaceans whose adults are sedentary. Uh, think about what sedentary means. It means they don't move on their own. The motile larva, motile means it can move on its own, find a suitable surface and then undergo a metamorphosis. So they undergo some type of physical change and chemical change to the sedentary form. The barnacle benefits by finding a habitat where nutrients are available. So in the case of lodging on a living organism, it gets transported around through the water, lots of new sources of food. Uh, basically, it's hitching a free ride. But the presence of the barnacle does not appear to hamper or enhance the survival of the animals carrying them. Unlike the bottom of the boat, uh, the whales don't have to have the barnacle scraped off. Another example of commensalism commonly used is that of the egret or there are a variety of other insect eating birds that have a relationship with large grazing animals such as cattle and elephants. I love this picture. The birds benefit from being in close proximity to a large beast and that large beast attracts insects. So some will argue that this is mutualistic because the birds reduce insects that may pester the large animal, but it usually is used as a commensal example. The uh, uh, large animals don't benefit that greatly. And a final example of a commensalistic relationship are a category of plants called epiphytes. Um, orchids are epiphytes. They grow in the tops of trees or are high up on a tree trunk as you see in this picture. Most do not rob nutrients or any significant light from the tree, thus they are not considered a parasite. The tree, for the most part, is not harmed and it doesn't benefit. 
but the epiphyte benefits from being in a location that is closer to the sunlight. Now, notice uh, that these three relationships, none of them are direct feeding relationships like predator-prey or herbivore feeding. Those are not considered a symbiotic relationship, nor are behaviors such as birds building nests in trees um, that these would be considered as part of the organism's niche but would not be considered a symbiotic relationship.